am joining this group as its chair. Um, so this is today's Friday, March 25th, and it's the fourth meeting of the working group on the status of libraries in Vermont. And today we will be focusing on facilities. Um, our work group is meeting today from 10 to 4, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we're going to pause for lunch from 12 to 2 p.m. And I just want to make everybody aware that our meeting is being recorded and that just as the other meetings have been posted on the Vermont Department of Libraries website and YouTube channel, this meeting will be posted on those in those locations. And um, I knew it would really be helpful to me and probably to people watching the video in the future if, if everyone could just take a minute to uh, briefly introduce themselves if each of our of our working group members could introduce themselves. So I'm gonna, I think Wendy, you were here first. So I'm gonna start it off with you and then pass it to someone else if you would. Okay, uh, my name is Wendy Sharkey. I'm in Bennington, at the Bennington Free Library. I'm head of circulation, cataloging and IT. Um, so that's where I'm from. Jenny? Or, no, Jenny's not a board member. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see who else is here. Um, Andy? Hi, I'm Andy Kolovis. I'm the Associate Director and Archivist at the Vermont Folklife Center. Um, I'm also a board member at the Brownell Library in Essex Junction. Um, I have, I've got an MLS with a focus on special collections. Nice to meet you both. Um, Meg? Allison. Great, thanks. Hi, Catherine. Um, my name is Meg. I'm president of the Vermont School Library Association. And that's not my Someone's got their mic on. <laughs> um, I am a librarian at U32 Middle and High School, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Um, let's see. Thank you. Um, Kelly McCash. Hi, I'm Kelly. I am the director at the Burnham Library in Colchester, and I am serving as the VLA rep. Great, nice to meet you. Is Susan O'Connell here? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Susan O'Connell. I'm the library director at the Craftsbury Public Library up in Craftsbury, Vermont. Great. Thanks, Susan. Nice to meet you. I see that um, Karen McCalla has joined us, and I've heard that Karen is going to be um, present today, but that she's lost her voice. So um, I just want to acknowledge that she's in the meeting right now. Maria Avery. Hello, good morning. I'm Maria Avery. Um, I work uh, in the Information and Instruction Services Department at the Howe Library at the University of Vermont. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Um, let's see, is Denise Percy here? She hasn't joined us yet. And then, let's see, Jeanette Fair. Let's see her. Hello, um, I'm Jeanette Fair. I'm the library director at the Rochester Public Library. Wonderful. Hi. And then I don't see Christopher from Vermont Humanities Council here yet. I don't believe he's here yet. Okay, great. I need to um, close this blind before I am personally blinded. Pardon me. There we go. Sorry about that. The sun has come out here in Barrie, so hopefully it will be shining. It is shining or will be shining where you are soon too. Um, thank you to all of the members of the working group uh, for being here and for introducing yourselves. I just want to start off with some housekeeping. Um, so 
Really importantly, I just want to acknowledge and share appreciation for Tom McMurdo and the work that Tom has done hosting the last three meetings and serving as chair of the working group while he was in the interim state library position. Um, I truly appreciate Tom's leadership and that he got the group started, that he convened those meetings, and that there's a really clear record of the group's work, which can be found on our webpage. So um, just want to share some appreciation for Tom and for the, the great work that he has done um, with this working group and as the interim state librarian. So wanted to be sure <laughs> to, to share that and to say thank you on behalf of um, everybody at the State Library for that. And I am seeing that Denise just joined us. So welcome, Denise. Um, I think some attendance here. Great. Very good. Um, so I wanted to move on to the minutes of our January 14th meeting. Um, also a thanks, a huge thank you um, that I want to give to Josh Muse, who is um, our technology facilitator for these meetings. And Josh has also been doing great work on minutes. And he shared the minutes of the January 14th meeting to our website. And I hope that you've had the time to review them. I wanted to check if anyone had suggestions or desires for anything to be corrected or edited. Hearing none, um, I'm going to ask members of the. Oh, Kelly, I see a hand up. I was just going to say I move to accept the minutes. Great. Do we have a second? Wendy? Yes, I second it. Great. OK, so um, I guess we'll do just um, an all in favor. Um, please unmute and say aye if you're one. The, just to clarify for anybody who's joining us, just members of the of the working group should vote. So all members of the working group in favor of accepting the minutes as written unmute and say aye if you can. If you're here and you can't speak and you're a member of the working group, uh, raise your hand. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Super, so the minutes of the January 14th meeting are approved. Um, I wanted to just share a reminder that in addition to the testimony we're going to hear today and that you've heard in prior meetings of the working group that people can submit written testimony directly to the State Library and that written testimony will be posted to the working group's website. Um, the testimony of the two prior topics is posted to the working group's website now and um, we are going to get the testimony on the topic of facilities posted um, very quickly to that group. Moving forward, uh, Josh Muse and I were discussing that it would be good to have the testimony in advance of the hearing. I mean, we've received um, in advance that we would like to get that posted so that members of the public can see the testimony as it's coming in. So we'll be working on that if that sounds OK to folks. Uh, Jeanette. Yeah, I just be, want to raise um, a concern and a question again now that we have a new state librarian um, as to when and who will be writing, um, you know, the recommendations of the working group. Um, I have a concern that if we wait until the end of all of the process, that a year for and a half from now, we may not have ideas fresh in our minds from the testimony um, you know, given. Um, and also how that um, those recommendations will be written. Will that be a committee of the working group? Will that be the uh, 
um, staff of the Department of Libraries. Um, how, what is the process that is planned at this point? Um, I'm glad that you asked the question. I was planning to talk about this a little bit later in the meeting so that we could start the testimony as close to 1015 as we can. Oh, no problem. Is I can wait. <laughs> sure. Be sure to bring it up again later. The short answer, Jeanette, is that um, it's important that the working group determine how we will work together and who will do the various tasks. And um, I, I do think that we need to schedule some time to discuss that in an open meeting. So um, that's the short answer. So we'll keep that in the back <laughs> of your mind for a little bit and then <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that topic a little bit later. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, I'm really glad that um, that folks have raised that. I, I was able to view um, some of the conversation at the last meeting. And so I know that that's really important to everyone on the group and it's important to me and to everybody here at the State Library too. Um, I mentioned before the meeting started when um, just as people were kind of chatting as we got going that um, that there are some there have been some questions and some suggestions about ways that the group may be able to work together and um, some of them included things like perhaps doing work via email or um, having subgroups and things of that nature. Um, I want to be sure to share with everybody that there's a resource um, that there's a resource online that it's really important that we are familiar with as members of the working group and um, it is available on the Vermont Secretary of State's open meeting page. Um, the recommendation in this resource is that group emails can can be seen to constitute meetings and so can working on shared documents outside the context of a meeting. So um, I want us to familiarize ourselves with that. And if we have if members of the group have questions about that topic, um, you can share them with me individually. Um, please don't email the whole group. Um, just share your questions with me individually and I can get some counsel on that. Um, OK, so we'll pick up the conversation about future meetings and what we may be able to do as a group to determine how we'll work together a little bit later today. Um, and now I want to move to our testimony on facilities. Just a reminder that per our charge, the working group may study whether library facilities and buildings could be improved with regard to energy efficiency, accessibility, flexibility, human health and safety, historic preservation, and intergenerational needs. And today we are gathered to hear from a number of members of our community. We have 14 individuals who are signed up for a testimony today. And we also have a public comment period at 345. Um, and we're going to begin hearing testimony with, with testimony from Jenny Rizicki. I hope that I have said your name correctly, Jenny. Um, so Jenny, if you could introduce yourself, thank you for being here today and just introduce yourself and and um, the next 15 minutes are yours to share your testimony and then for members of the working group to engage and ask questions of you. So we are here to hear you. OK, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just pleased to be here today and um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Y'all are doing laudable work. Um, my name is Jenny Rosicki. I'm the director of the John G. McCullough Free Library in North Bennington, Vermont. And I have learned an awful lot about facilities in the past year and a half or two. And I'm here to share just a little bit of the experience over at the McCullough Library. Um, it, it seems to me that the, the spirit of the library is often hemmed in by very physical, tangible realities. Um, and sometimes that affects our work and ability to serve, you know, serve our communities. Um, 
in recent years, the McCullough Library has seen an absolute surge in visitors. Well, pre pandemic, but still we're doing OK. But um, surge in visitors, new P new um, members, you know, lots of activity and that put a strain on what I learned was a very fragile. Um, historic building, uh, the pipes, the plumbing, the heating system, all of these things uh, very fragile and. The systems that were out of order and placed further out of order by all this activity um, were had not been maintained. They were dealt with on an emergency basis. Um, so when the <laughs> when the 60 or 70 year old furnace decided to stop working, we had to hurry scurry to get a new furnace and water heater and oil tanks and all of that uh, placed within the building. Um, you know, the basement flooded and it was horrible. And I was told that this happened every couple of years. Yet nothing had been done about it. So, um, but also with more visitors, uh, it's more use of the restrooms, which were very much out of date. So, um, the wiring very much systems. Uh, I'm happy to say that we are currently under construction. We um, are slated to reopen late June. Uh, fingers crossed, but we are. Um, expanding the size of the restrooms to make them accessible and family friendly, new plumbing, uh, new electrical wiring. Uh, uh, smoke detectors, you know, um, wired into the building um, an HVAC system to improve indoor air quality, uh, which is heat pump compatible. I, I still have to figure out how this all will work with the furnace, but um, so energy efficiency is in there. But we're we're looking at you know fundamental questions of safety and access um, and use of a historic space. And so it's kind of it's a delicate balance and we were able to get this first phase done. We're looking at the second phase, which is sort of an, an elevator addition on the back. Um, and again, funding is the the thing that will hinder progress on on that front. And you know, um, so that's kind of where we are, but those very very physical realities here. And um, I'm not sure if it fits within facilities, but we're also struggling with uh, furnishings. We have um, our children's room especially is just sort of um, a hodgepodge of military surplus, school surplus. Um, I don't even know where some of the stuff came from. I can't figure it out, but it's not ideal. And I think it does not create the best atmosphere and an aspirational space uh, for for our families and um, our youngest neighbors. So those are our challenges, but um, and there's a lot of goodwill and hope for these improvements. But again, we always come up against funding to figure out where where is it going to come from? Um, I guess I can take questions at this point. I'm not sure I'll, what else you want to know. Okay. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. Um, I'm just curious, what was the response you received when asking um, why systems like the plumbing, the electrical and stuff were not maintained, knowing that failure to maintain them is more expensive than the cost of maintenance. So I'm still relatively new in the position and the idea was we will ride out the. <clears throat> we will ride out the old furnace as long as humanly possible um, or mechanically possible. Um, that the replacement, it, the upfront cost for replacement 
was, and again, that, that furnace had, for example, had been there for 60 years. That's my best guess. They had never seen one like it. Um, so, and we had some more um, urgent financial needs um, regarding just making the year to year work um, to say nothing of uh, improvements or energy efficiency. But I'm very pleased to say that we are in a much better position now. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Jenny, you said that you had to learn a lot about facilities. Is there something out there that would have helped in that process? Um, you know, like a, 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 a facilities guru? Um, <laughs> oh, right. I think what would have been most useful was a care and keeping of old buildings uh, course in library school. Um, just some like here's some because so many of us are in older, older buildings um, to have at least some sense of, you know, here's here's something to keep in mind about very old wiring or something like that. That would have been useful retroactively going forward. I think a consultant about here's what you need would be really, really useful. Thank you. Hi, Jenny, this is um, Meg Allison. Um, I just had a question looking at your written testimony. Um, the first phase of your renovations, you cited um, ARP funds. What does that yeah. stand for? Oh, the ARPA funds. The um, ARP, I think it because it's not an act anymore anyway it's arpa money and um i'm not sure that, what that is can you spell out that acronym i'm not oh the american uh, recovery program act uh i probably got that all wrong but um those were the post covid covid funds that were distributed to municipalities um we have and i'm fairly confident the village trustees will approve. We ask for $151,000, which is, you know, more than our annual budget uh, total uh, to help with the entirety of um, an HVAC system because our, our air conditioners decided to stop working last year. And I was like, instead of, instead of just a one-on-one -on -one replacement, let's find something that's a little more a better solution and a, a, a more complete holistic solution to that. Great, thank you, Jenny. And I apologize to other members. I just noticed we should be using our hands. My apologies. Oh, thank you. And Meg, just um, the, the acronym is the American Rescue Plan. Um, there are funds through this that have been given to municipalities. There are also state funds um, and there are even funds that we at the State Library have been administering from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, right, let me check on who else's hands are up. It's like um, I've got Kelly and Andy and I'm not sure which of you had your hand up first. So Andy me... did. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, Andy. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. I could have waited too, so it's not. Uh, this this is more of a question um, for uh, people at the division and people uh, associated with VLA. Has um, the Division of Historic Preservation or the Preservation Trust ever offered any sort of training opportunities specifically aimed at libraries and the needs of historic buildings and libraries? That's the general question. And then for Jenny, like, do you feel like something like that might be useful? So I think the um, I think the Preservation Trust has offered something similar to this, I have yet to take advantage of it. Um, but I know some of our trustees attended a retreat, I wanna say that they did a workshop um, about older buildings and opportunities through Preservation Trust. Thank you. 
Um, I know I can look this up in the in your report statistics that Josh compiles for us, but because I have you here, um, what is your annual budget and what is your staff number? Oh, goodness. So we are, I think we were at last year, 146,000 uh, for our overall budget. It's, I believe it's under 150. And uh, for staff, I'm the only full timer and that was the recognition of full time came last year before that I had been 30 hours a week. Um, and we are a staff of five. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm wondering, Jenny, first I wanna just thank you for providing your testimony today and for making the time to be here with us. It's really helpful to us in the working group. Um, you mentioned a couple of things that sound like things that we might be able to assist with at the state level here in the Department of Libraries, um, such as having some type of coursework or sessions on the care and keeping of old buildings, um, having consultant services. We don't have that capacity currently, but perhaps in the future could. Um, can you think of any other, those are really helpful, helpful suggestions for me to hear. Can you think of anything else at the state level that, that could help you and your municipality to address the concerns that and the issues that you experience? Hmm. Uh, fun fact, we are, we serve and are supported by three municipalities actually. So Bennington, Shaftesbury and North Bennington are all in our service area and um, we receive funding from all three of those uh, uh, well, villages and towns. So um, I'm not sure. I mean, the the one thing that we just keep coming up against is the funding for these changes. Um, for example, the current uh, project that we were that we're in the middle of, and why I'm taking test <laughs> doing this testimony from home. There's solzols and things going. Uh, at the library itself uh, is, is funding that that project was 345,000 to get everything in place. And the best estimate I have for the next phase is 800,000 and who knows what that will do, you know what the price for that will look like. Um, in in the next couple of years when we're ready to do that. So um, and that's that's formidable. Um, I think Funding and guidance are the two things that would would help the most in getting these things done. Thank you. Okay, we have um, time for one more question. I see Susan's got their hand up. Thanks. Uh, hi, Jenny. Thanks. Um, Thinking as sitting on the working group here, I, I feel like I'm kind of in a position of trying to take in all the information and figure out what is it that we can push out to the legislature, basically, what, what recommendations can we make? This is sort of the same question as you've already been asked, um, but I wonder if there's a way, if it would be helpful if there was something encoded in libraries that recognized a, a specific need for facilities themselves. Um, like standards used to say librarians had to either have a certificate of public librarianship or an MLS. And even though standards aren't really active right now, almost every single job description that you see has that in it because at one time that was something that we had to follow. Would something like that be useful for facilities? And if so, what would it be? I'm just, you know, this is a brand new idea. I'm just kind of throwing this out there. But I wonder what you think about that and what what would be helpful for you to have to go to your municipalities to say, we have to do X. What might that look like? Hmm. So as a library that had struggled to meet some standards in the past. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I think that having those in place, because if you have a standard, it has, it generally has a repercussion. If you don't have it blank, um, I'm not sure having that standard in place would help us. Okay. Interesting. It may hurt, um, because it would be one more thing to, to meet that we can't. You know, Mm -hmm. and I think even if you can't make it there, perhaps having a plan like the Preservation Trust says, you know, if things aren't right right now, what is your plan for this building? And I think just even having the plan with steps and a timeline, that's a nice that's a nice standard to have because it says, okay, at least you're thinking about it. Um, mm-hmm. And it gives you steps to take, but saying, you know, you must, you must meet these criteria can be a real strain, especially on the smaller, uh, smaller libraries among us. Absolutely. That's a really interesting way to look at it. Thank you. And with that, I want to thank you, Jenny, for being here today with us. If you think of other things you'd like to share that you haven't already stated in your testimony, um, if you think of other um, ideas of what might be able to help you, please feel free to submit additional written testimony. Um, please feel free to stay on and hear others today give testimony. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to move to our second individual who's here this morning to provide testimony, and that is Amy Grasmick. And um, just a reminder, I think everyone's muted right now, but I'll just keep trying to remind everybody of this. If you're not the person testifying or asking a question, please mute your microphone and please um, turn your camera off. And Amy, the, the floor is yours. If you could introduce yourself and then begin your testimony. Thanks for being here today. Great, thank you for providing this opportunity. Um, my name is Amy Grasnick. I'm the director of Kimball Public Library in Randolph, which is smack dab in the middle of the state. I have been the director here for um, 20 plus years now. And just to kind of orient you to the size of the library, we serve two towns, Randolph and Braintree. We have a service population of about 6,000. Our annual budget is $340,000 this year, and we have just over three FTE, um, including three professional staff and um, three three paras. Um, So for anybody who knows me, you will know that I have a great fondness for this book, Palaces for the People by Eric Kleinenberg. And the reason that I'm going to talk just briefly about this is because if COVID has done anything, it's pointed out how vital social infrastructure is for the well-being of our communities. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, social infrastructure is the places where people can meet. They can interact, they can form relationships with one another. Um, And these these places really support individual well being, community well being, community resilience. And I know I'm speaking to the choir when I say public libraries are a vital piece of social infrastructure. Um, you know, we're social infrastructure are places, libraries, parks, schools, um, restaurants, community centers. And as such, we have physical in- infrastructure too, which is what we're here to talk about. Um, I am delighted to report that Kimball Library will finally be reopening our doors to the public on April 1st. And the reason that the building has been closed since last November is because we don't have mechanical ventilation. Um, I also suspect that many of you are familiar with the webinar that the Department of Libraries did last fall inviting UVM engineer Eve to beef to talk about what happens when people breathe indoors and what does that mean about public health. So with no ventilation system in place, with cold weather, that meant that keeping windows open for ventilation was just did not make any sense. We made the very difficult decision to close the building to the public and to move to low and no contact services. Um, 
I mean, we're heroes, right? Because we have really worked incredibly hard to maximize the services we can offer. And yet what people really want is to be in the building. And we want them to be here. Um, so April 1st, we figure it's going to be warm enough to be able to open windows and not freeze too badly um, to have adequate ventilation. But this is really very temporary kind of fix. And so we're hard on the hunt now for an HVAC system that will be energy efficient, that will be integrated, and it will provide uh, adequate air change an hour per hour that we don't have to close the building again because of COVID or some other respiratory disease. Uh, this project um, is going to cost us about $80,000, we think. We're still getting estimates on that. And um, that's, you know, not a small chunk of change. Um, we have another project that we have to deal with in the next couple of years, and it's it sounds kind of funny. We have a hole in the roof, right? Actually, we have a slight leak in our copper-clad cupola, and that did not provide enough ventilation to be able to keep the building open all winter long. Too bad. Um, that project um, will include replacing the copper cladding on the cupola, uh, re um, doing any kind of repair work that's been caused by an active leak up there for at least five years um, and some other historic preservation work. And at this point, I'm sure it's going to top the $200,000 uh, estimate that we had a couple of years ago. So we've got nearly $300,000 worth of capital improvements that we plan to make in the next two years. Um, Last but not least, let me just say thank you, little chipmunk. Um, we discovered you in the library and then learned that we had a hole in our foundation as well. So even that was not enough airflow, darn it, to get people in here earlier. But there's another project that just turned up out of the blue, had no idea until we saw Mr. Chipmunk um, exit the building by, a, by our foundation. So these are, you know, these are pressing needs, they need to be attended to. We're in a 120 year old building that's on the National Register. Um, we have a responsibility both to maintain this amazing landmark and also to make it maximally accessible to our community. And just to give you an idea, I mean, I've been here for um, more than 20 years. I did kind of a, a survey of how many capital improvement projects I personally have managed everything from a renovation of our teen room to a um, very recent renovation of our ADA accessible restroom, fire sprinkler system installation, um, insulation projects, new lighting, new carpeting, um, an exterior walkway, drainage work, foundation work, replacing our wheelchair lift, replacing our boiler, um, and as Jenny said, you know, they don't teach us this in library school. So I came into this job not expecting to be a construction project manager. And yet, lo and behold, that is effectively what I, I am. Um, I've managed more than a half a million dollars worth of capital projects on this building in my time. And funding, yes, funding is very tricky. Um, it is, it is very challenging not only to find grant money that will support these projects. Um, I am personally grateful for the building's community's grants that the state administers through the Department of um, Buildings and General Services, through the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation, through the Vermont Arts Council, um, USDA also provides funding for community facilities and all of these are um, vital sources of funding, um, but my library trustees have had to figure out how to pick up about half of the costs overall, and it's an ongoing battle with the select board. So we're a municipal library in a department of the town, but the select board is reluctant um, to recognize the responsibility that the taxpayers have to maintain this building. So that's a struggle. Um, I will also say, I don't think this will be a shock, that in a female-dominated profession, 
working with contractors in a very male dominated profession, there is um, an element of sexism that is in play in terms of being able to manage these projects. I am extremely grateful that Vermont Technical College is just up the road from my library and I was able to audit a construction management class, which gave me a lot better tools for how to talk the talk, um, how to understand, how to negotiate and so on and so forth. That's been hugely helpful. Um, but I think for me, the most exciting piece about the Department of Libraries request to be included in Governor Scott's budget with money, not just for capital improvement costs, but also to hire a construction project manager or consultant to help libraries figure out how to make these projects work is incredibly helpful and important. So thank you for that. Um, and I think I will stop there um, and hopefully there's time for questions. Thank you so much, Amy. There, there is time for questions. We have about six minutes um, left of your testimony for questions. I see that Jeanette has put her hand up, Jeanette. Hi, Amy. So tell us more about this construction management through the Department of Libraries. This is the first I've heard of it. So my understanding is that in the funding that was requested through the governor's budget, that in addition to money specifically to be distributed to libraries for construction work, there is money included to have a construction project manager for three years. Now that may have changed and if that is so, go ahead, Catherine, what's the story there? Thank you, Amy, and I'm, I'm appreciative that you um, mentioned this and that you're so knowledgeable about it. Um, the governor's budget um, includes 15 million in capital funds through the money given to the state, the ARPA money, that um, American Rescue Plan money that the state is eligible to receive. So it's 15 million for, for capital improvements to libraries to improve people's access to the internet specifically. So it's access to the buildings which are the place where the folks are using the computers and the technology and the, the broadband and getting access to the internet. Um, and there is also 900,000 budgeted for two positions, um, one of them being on the administrative side and one of them being um, the in, in a project manager type role. Um, that would be for a limited duration. They would be um, temporarily funded by this ARPA funding to oversee that $15 million. Um, and those grants that are given out to libraries, public libraries in Vermont, and that is um, over four years. Um, to share with the group, there, there is something else that the um, Department of Libraries, with the support of the governor's office, has requested. It's a different funding stream. Um, just this week, we requested um, some congressionally directed spending funding. Um, we, we requested this of Senator Leahy's office, and uh, we requested $10 million to grant out. So that is not, neither of those is yet a sure thing. <laughs> I want to share these. They both have different processes behind them. But um, the capital bill has been moving through. My understanding is I think it's back with the Senate now um, and that the funding the last time we checked on it was still looking good. It was still the full amount was being funded when it left the House um, and the congressionally directed spending. I'm very new to that process, but my first request for that in was so grateful for the governor's appreciation uh, for the governor's support of that. So really appreciate that. Um, that he gave us the green light to go for that, that funding. And we will keep the library community posted, of course, about this. I see, um, Jeanette, did you have another question or? No, sorry, forgot to put my head, my hand down. <laughs> no worries, okay, Meg. 
Hi, thanks for joining us today, Amy. I just wanted to um, just thank you for your courage in naming um, the sexism, the systemic sexism that you're encountering um, in your work, um, trying to do renovations in your library. Um, just want to thank you for the courage for naming it. Um, I think this is a hurdle that we face in female dominated fields and um, naming it is the first step we can go towards helping to eradicate it, all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Were there other questions from the working group members? Um, I guess in that case, I'll ask a question. I'm, I'm curious, Amy, if you could describe a little bit about how the programs and services you'd like to provide, aside from just being open, but are there other ways in which the, the library services that you and your team would like to provide for the community are really negatively impacted by the structure of the building? We are fortunate in that we're in a building that was purpose built as a library and it has a fairly open floor plan. Um, the main level was the only level that was intended for public use. The, the lower level that is now our youth services department was not intended to be used. And so that space is a little less flexible. Um, I, there are things that we will not, never be able to do in this building. So for instance, we won't be able to offer a community room. Um, the, the spaces that are large enough for meetings to happen or for us to present programs are also spaces that house computers or house collections. And so, and we see a demand for community meeting space. Um, this building is constrained on its site, so we can't really expand it. Um, and so in a way, I hate to say this, but it is becoming sort of an, an artifact that is too constrained to meet the, the stated needs of our community for more public meeting space. Um, we, we just can't do it here. Now, could we do it? in an additional space, in an annex? Could we separate our youth services into a, an integrated youth center that would include a teen center, library services, early childhood education, something like that? Um, I think we could, and then we could repurpose the space that our youth department now fills. So that that's kind of, that's extremely aspirational. Um, but yes, public meeting space, we we can't meet the demands that we're hearing from our community. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And thank you for coming today and being with us and um, sharing what your experiences are. It's really helpful to hear from you directly and we really appreciate your testimony today. Thank you for this opportunity and, and keep up with the good work. Thank you. And if you think of anything else that you'd really like to share again, Please don't hesitate to, to submit something written. We are still accepting that. And please, um, please feel welcome to stay for as much of the proceedings today as you'd like to. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Now I'm gonna call on our third, um, our third individual who has signed up to provide testimony, and that's Emily DiGiulio. Good morning. Thank you. Thank Hi. You here. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you. And um, thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity to talk with uh, the working group and uh, fellow librarians this morning. Um, uh, I am the public librarian and um, library director of the Fairfax Community Library in Fairfax. Um, we are a combined library uh, both public and school library, and um, we serve um, a population of just over 5,000 um, with uh, over 800 students in this uh, grade pre-K to 12 school. Um, I work with uh, two other public library colleagues and uh, as well as um, to school librarians um, and uh, we share the space during the school day. Um, it has been um, uh, 
a privilege to be working here for close to four years and the um, the community is very supportive of the library uh, model or format that has been in place for I would say over 50 years. Um, ideally, um, a, a public libraries should meet the needs of all users and uh, I see this library meeting the needs of many users in many ways. Uh, one of the improvements that um, greatly helped uh, our library this over the past two years was the addition of a, a open Wi-Fi in our parking lot and that has allowed uh, community members to access the Wi-Fi when the building is closed if they don't have um, access at home. We um, have uh, a uh, space that provides one open uh, floor plan for community members and students um, and uh, much of our programming takes place in uh, this one space. Uh, however, we do also have a meeting room, a conference room where I'm sitting right now uh, that is available for um, various meetings and is used by both the school and the public. One of the things that I notice we um, have struggled with in our library is adequate uh, programming space. There's a real need for programming here in Fairfax and um, to have that public community space that is um, separate and um, large enough to accommodate a group or a presenter with a group while um, while being um, not interfering with uh, perhaps school classes that are happening uh, and other events um, going on and just general public in the library um, is one of the needs that we have um, found. Um, and uh, the there there's an ongoing discussion about this facility in its um, current form. We have people who come into the library who are very glad to see that uh, they're here during the school day. They can see classes and students. Uh, they kind of have an idea of what's happening in the school by being here in the library, uh, and they feel connected to uh, the school community that way. Uh, we also have patrons who have expressed over the years that um, it wouldn't it be nice to have a separate facility uh, that is just a public library. Uh, that voice has not been as strong in our community up to now. Um, and I think that um, in general, we are meeting, um, you know, um, providing a, a physical environment that is supporting equitable access. Um, it's part of our strategic plan to provide a welcoming and safe um, facility for the community. And I, I, I do think in many ways we are able to do that. Um, over the years, there have also been a couple of opportunities for capital improvements to take place in this space. Um, they have been part of uh, bonds to improve the BFA Fairfax School building. Um, unfortunately, um, neither of the two that I'm aware of have passed, so um, improvements haven't really um, gone forward. Um, and we, we, we continue to talk about um, whether or not that might happen in the future. I think that's all I have to share at this time today, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. We really are glad that you came today and that you've shared um, your your experience and really helped us to understand some of the dynamics in your library. Um, having a having a school public library combined is a very um, it's it's a unique creature in the world of libraries, and I know that we have a number of these unique creatures here in in Vermont. Um, 
so the, I'm really glad that you were able to share about that. And I'm wondering if any of the the members have any of the working group members have questions for you. Seeing no hands, I guess I'll ask um, at least a couple of questions. <laughs> um, can you can you explain how you cohabitate the combined library and sort of um, how it's spread out? You actually have more. You have a little more than eight minutes, so you could you could share how that works. And if you know from colleagues, if you feel comfortable representing them from other libraries of that of this particular type, that would be helpful to us. Sure, um, uh, I do have a feeling that in um, some other combined libraries, there are specific. Uh, I've heard of one in particular where there's a specific day that is a day for school classes to use the library, and then there are other days when the library is open to the public. Um, with our model, uh, we have hours that we're open to the public that um, you begin at 9 or 10 in the morning, go throughout the school day and then into the late afternoon or evening, depending on the day and then as well as and we also have Saturday hours. So during those school hours, we have uh, a couple of small office slash workroom areas where we are all um, uh, working and near the circulation desk, um, all kind of available for classes that come in and um, public patrons who come in during the day. Uh, one of the, the things that is a limiting factor for the public library is that we really can't have uh, certain types of programs during the school day in the library. We do have story time one morning a week and that does happen during the school day. However, there are no classes scheduled during that time. So um, the school library has been very generous in giving the public library um, that time and space for story time. Uh, and um, we also have uh, been um, kind of uh, guided by the uh, security that the school provides and has um, has uh, kind of uh, how that has changed over the years, excuse me. And what we have is a doorbell at one of our doors. So public library patrons who come in during the day do need to ring this doorbell to be um, let into the library. And we also have a door that goes from the library into the school that students and school staff can be let through. Um, however, uh, public, we have to be mindful that public patrons are not going through that door, that they go through the main doors of the school if they need to go into the school for some reason. Um, let's see, as far as other ways that we share the um, space, I could get into um, the unique way that we share our collection. Um, we have a uh, an adult fiction collection. Our nonfiction is really a combined adult and youth nonfiction. Um, and then our youth, um, our young adult fiction and juvenile fiction and picture books are really uh, a combined but primarily um, school library collection. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, well, we're not typically going to do things in the chat just so that we we keep all of the, the conversation audibly. Someone did mention that South Burlington Library had a combined school and public library, and I can attest to that having been a South Burlington resident for my entire childhood, that that was what I went to, so. Oh, great. Yes. Um, Jeanette has her hand up. Hey, um, since this today's testimony is, is more about facilities, my question, um, is directed specifically at your facility's budget as the Fairfax Community Library. I, I have not visited your library. I assume most community libraries are housed within the school's building and how that impacts your budget. Are, are you, do you contribute towards the school's expenses of maintaining the whole space 
or are basically you there free on behalf of the school? Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Um, thank you, Jeanette. We uh, do contribute to some uh, a, a relatively small portion of the uh, maintenance and uh, phone service that is through the school. Um, but we are here uh, as part of the school as well. So the majority of the expenses, excuse me for maintenance, are, um, are taken on by the school. I don't, I'm not, and I, and I don't want to um, uh, not address certain aspects of that if there was something else in particular that you were asking? Well, just, you know, things like uh, utilities are, you know, within the library budget is heat and light and mm -hmm. maintenance as a part of the library budget, or are you basically guests of the school? We, I guess uh, in that way, we are guests of the school and um, we are saving the town of Fairfax a considerable amount of uh, tax revenue, tax money uh, in that way as well, um, because we are here um, within the school library. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Susan. Oops. Hi, Emily. Hi, Susan. Um, so I'm interested, it seems as though many of our community libraries are moving away from that, um, that style of providing services. And as you mentioned, it is such a cost savings for towns. Um, I wonder if you have any insight onto, as to why it is that it is working so well in Fairfax. It sounds like there are some areas of discomfort, but for the most part, you feel like it is serving townspeople quite well. Um, so I'm curious if you have any, what are your words of wisdom as to how it is that it's working well in, in Fairfax? Uh, well, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I have, um, my words would be so wise, but what what I, my original thought is that we um, are, um, are open uh, to the community, I think, uh, a uh, significant number of hours, and that seems to work for the community. Uh, the community is um, made up of uh, a large portion of longtime Fairfax residents who uh, who know the school and know the library and um, are uh, are kind of happy to have this continue as it is. And um, uh, um, and I think there has been, um, uh, you know, fortunately for me, a very nice working relationship with the school library staff, as well as the school itself. Um, we're, I feel like we're very supported and, you know, there's never been a question that the public library is welcome as part of the school library building and the school community. Is there a lot of, uh, discussion when talking with townspeople about the cost savings about it? Like, are they aware of what a great deal it is financially for them? Um, I think in a general way, I don't know if there's been a much of discussion uh, since I've been here about specifically um, how much is being saved or what the costs are relative to the public library having its own facility. But that's a good question. That might be a good discussion coming up. <laughs> yeah, <if you> need <laughs> yeah, Thank right. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're at the 15 minute mark for your testimony. Um, I do see Wendy's hand is up. Wendy, do you have a question that? It's um, really quick. I was, <laughs> really, really quick. I was just wondering how transient the population is in Fairfax and whether that could be a, a reason why people are just used to the system and happy to continue doing using the system. Uh, 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 thank you, Wendy. That's a great question. I think uh, there, um, as I was saying, I don't have the exact figures, but there is a large portion of the population that is stable and that has um, are longtime residents. However, Fairfax is one of 
the faster growing towns, um, at least in Franklin County. And um, so um, we have we have a fair number of new residents. We are, you know, uh, we get several new uh, library patrons each month. So um, uh, that um, that doesn't seem to have a big impact on um, the combined library model at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. We really appreciate your coming today and sharing with us. And if you think of anything else you'd like to share, please feel free to do additional written testimony. Um, and please feel free to stay on and listen to the testimony of others or rejoin throughout the day. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bye bye. Our next scheduled provider of testimony is Joe Bertoloni. I'm not sure if Joe is on the call yet. Okay. I'm not seeing him. Let's see, Joe. The person after Joe is Kendra Faber Ferry, and I'm not sure I see Karen. Karen just said that Joe was coming right from teaching a class and she would text him. Yeah, I think we don't have Kendra either, I don't believe. I can't jump and go back. Um, we could, um, yeah, we, if we, if we, if we had a gap, we could probably go to uh, Dana if, uh, if the next available person who seems to be in the meeting right now. Okay. In that case, let's jump ahead to Dana, who is signaling readiness with camera on. So, Dana, is it okay to to for you to um, yeah and be able to fit Joe in hopefully next? Yeah, I might be a little frazzled, but that's fine. <clears throat> um, and I apologize for my voice. I'm homesick today, so I'm a little stuffy, um, so I, I apologize for that. But hello, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to testify today. Well, now I can't see. Now I can't see anyone. Can you guys still hear me, Catherine? Yep, yeah. you're still okay. good. OK, great. Um, my name is, is Dana Hart. I'm the director of the Ilsley Public Library in Middlebury, Vermont. I've been there about four years now. Um, for a little bit of context, Middlebury has a little over 8,000 residents, um, and our operating budget is about $750,000 a year. That doesn't include benefits or, or capital expenses, um, but I, I hope that kind of paints the portrait of a, a pretty well-funded public library. We're in a very lucky position in a lot of ways, um, but our our facilities um, are kind of at the breaking point and starting to fail. And in that regard, we are not so lucky. Um, we have about 18,000 square feet spread out over three separate additions. Our original building was built in 1924. Uh, and then we had two subsequent addition, additions put on in 1977 and then one in 1988. Um, we also have a branch library in East Middlebury called Sarah Partridge. I'm, I'm happy to talk more about how the two branches function if people have questions about that. And we also um, have a tenant, Middlebury Community Television, that takes up the third floor of the, the public library building. Um, we, we don't charge them. We consider them to be a partner. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that relationship as well. <clears throat> um, I detailed in, in some I think I covered some of the problems with our current building in my testimony, the, the written testimony I submitted, so I won't go into too much detail on those, um, other than to say that our aspirations for a public library building are one that is safe, um, accessible to everyone in our community, um, energy efficient and sustainable, uh, flexible, and, and we don't have that right now. And again, I'm happy to go into greater detail um, if people have questions, but I think I addressed a lot of 
ways that 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 our building are not were is not working for us um, in my written testimony. What we're really struggling with right now, I think, is something that a lot of public libraries in Vermont will identify with, which is that on the one hand, there's the services we provide, which are vital and ample and um, matter a great deal to our community. And then there's the building that we're in, which kind of holds us back and does not allow us to expand and does not allow us to really meet the needs of our community. And then there's the funding that it would take to get us into a building that is adequate, that is safe, um, that can help us meet the needs of our community. Um, our, we recently did a feasibility study, well, feels recent, it was four years ago, um, and we found out it would cost about $10 million to do a major renovation expansion of the Ilsley Public Library on the footprint um, that we have. Um, this would get us up to about 26,000 square feet, which is what we think we would need um, after doing a pretty comprehensive uh, building program analysis. Uh, and, and this would cost $10 million. So $10 million is a staggering amount of money, of course. Um, Middlebury, as I said, supports its library well with a robust operating budget, and there is support for the library in the community. But a $10 million bond is, is just not possible for our community. Um, we can fundraise privately, and we will, but again, getting to that $10 million um, figure will be very difficult. So I think there's a real gap in a lot of um, public libraries in Vermont between the services we provide and the buildings that we occupy. Um, and when I try and, and make this equation work in my mind, there's just no way to get the funding from our local communities alone. Um, I'm not quite sure how we make that equation work. I certainly think funding from the state and federal level would go a long way towards closing that gap. Uh, and for that reason, I'm incredibly grateful to the uh, Department of Libraries for pursuing such funding. That's fantastic news. Um, but that that is the challenge that we face now. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has about our building or um, what it would cost to address our building needs. Thank you so much, Dana, for being here and for jumping in and going earlier than scheduled. Thanks for your flexibility. Um, I see that Kelly has a question for you. Uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you, Dana, um, for your testimony. Um, it was uh, extremely articulate um, in the details, especially talking about things that are very specific, um, I think, to libraries like sight lines, um, things like that, that a lot of even architects don't think about when creating buildings. Um, a building project I worked on, um, we had specified which way the stacks had to go. And somewhere along the lines, they decided that they would look better the other way. And then I came into the project, you know, or into the building and I was just like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, oh, well, so-and-so thought that it would look nicer this way. And I was just like, and we can't see anything this way. No, it's got to be turned the, the other way. Um, so just thank you very much. Um, I think you did a great job um, of laying finer points on what some of the problems are. So I hope you feel better. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's the bottom line is that library buildings are incredibly costly, um, especially when you're building onto historic structures, which almost every public library in Vermont is dealing with, because um, people don't realize that, yeah, you need sight lines. Um, every floor really needs to be able to, to bear the weight of collections because you don't know where your collections are going to move in 10 or 20 or 50 years. You need sight lines, which means as few load bearing walls and pillars as possible. And every single area needs to be handicapped accessible. Um, I mean, right now, this, I mean, it's a nightmare scenario. If we, if Ilsley hired someone that was um, in a wheelchair, I, I do not know how we could accommodate that person. I mean, it's not a good situation for us. It makes it, you know, the, the patron perspective is, is one thing. We're not incredibly um, welcoming and accommodating to people um, in wheelchairs or on crutches or even with strollers for that matter. Um, but then from a staff perspective as well, it would be very difficult for, for someone in a wheelchair to work in our staff facilities if, if it's possible at all. Thank you, Dana. Are there other questions or comments? Meg. Great. Hi. Thank you, Dana. I too have a cold. 
first time I took my mask off in my school and I caught a terrible cold. It's not COVID, but I've been sick in two years. So I, I sympathize with you. Um, I just want to just for the committee and put on our um, testimony, the, the video portion of this, something that you said in your written testimony that's so powerful, which is how can our library be welcoming to all when it's not accessible to all? Um, and you raise a very interesting point. You're coming from a well-funded library and still the accessibility issue is not being met. And so my posit to the committee and anyone, you know, I'm just putting this on the record. So as we go and look at this testimony and make recommendations is finding a source of funds to ensure that all of our libraries, public and school, um, meet the mandates for handicapped accessibility. Um, and for not just for our patrons and our students, but also for our employees. So you raised a, a, a phenomenal point. In addition to one of safety, you know, working in a school, I know exactly who's coming into my my library on any given moment. Um, but public libraries, having worked in one myself, you know, there there is an issue of safety. And I just want to emphasize as well your testimony on that point, um, because we don't want to wait until there is a tragedy before we collectively decide to address this issue, either in our own communities or on the state level. Um, and again, we are, you know, female dominated um, profession, oftentimes working solely in public libraries into the evening hours at any time of day. And I think it's an important point that you raised and um, one I hadn't considered yet in terms of um, the facilities issue. So thank you for raising that, Dana. And I hope you're on the men soon. Thank you. Yeah, if I sound breathless and feverish, it's because of the fever. <laughs> So I apologize. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dana. You're heroic coming to, to testify in that situation. And um, you sound like you do not have a fever. I would not have known <laughs> personally. I saw another hand up and then it went down. But were there other questions for Dana? For members of the working group? I guess I actually have one more thing to add, which I didn't include in my written testimony, but which occurs to me now. Um, and someone earlier might have said this and I missed it, but um, as a public library director, I spend an inordinate amount of my time each week, each day, uh, dealing with my library's facilities. Um, plaster crumbling from the wall, leaks coming in through the basement. Um, I mean, you name it, an old building, it takes constant, constant upkeep. It's something that I was certainly not prepared for in library school. Um, I'm not a homeowner, so I, I don't have that experience either. Um, and I, I find myself often sort of chasing behind one, uh, one problem as it pops up to the next. Um, some sort of support uh, at a more comprehensive level, someone to walk through public library buildings with us and point out things that might become problems. Uh, in the next year or five years or 10 years might be really helpful um, from a planning perspective. Because I know I don't have the um, the expertise to walk through my own building and say, oh, you know, in a few years, you're probably going to want to take a look and, and fix that. And I often think if I had that perspective, maybe I'd, I'd be able to be more proactive. Um, not everyone. Yeah, so that, that I think that would be a helpful thing for public librarians in Vermont as well. Thank you for sharing that constructive suggestion. Jeanette, I see that your hand is up. Yeah, um, while I, I think that it would be wonderful if there could be a staff or consulting position through the Department of Libraries to help um, individual libraries assess their buildings, I did want to point out that uh, Preservation Trust does make small grants to have a professional architect um, come to your building and and review all of your systems and and pretty much lay out a plan um, for um, correcting deficiencies. So, thank you. Thanks for that. And I think maybe another hand, Kelly McCann. So. Middlebury doesn't have um, someone on staff at the town. I'm not sure. I don't remember um, how Isley Falls are they. What kind of library are they? We're a municipal library and we do have a public um, works department. So we have a director of public works planning um, that's available to help with larger 
larger scale issues. So like once once a need has been identified, basically he he has stepped in to help um, kind of project manage that. OK, would it be possible because we have someone who comes in and kind of walks through the building once a year to look and kind of plan out um, like there's a capital facilities plan, um, mm -hmm. but you know, to kind of look and say, OK, this is something that we've got to take care of in the next year or two or um, is that something maybe that they could do? I know in smaller towns and villages they can't do that, but might yeah. that be something? I should push for that. So, I don't know, like I said, we have that here, and so um, I know it's not possible in smaller communities, but that might be something you can do. Yeah, I'm gonna thank you for that suggestion. I'll push for that and look into it because that would be incredibly helpful for us. So we're not always kind of playing catch up. Thank you both. Is there, are there any other questions for Dana today? Not seeing any. I want to thank you, Dana, for coming and for sharing about your experiences in the public area at the Wellesley Public Library. Um, please feel free to share anything additional that you think of that you'd like the working group to be aware of <coughs> to facilities or the other two topics that we've heard <coughs> present testimony on in writing if you if you think of something that just slipped your mind today or something comes to you on these topics in the future um, we just appreciate your time today and especially coming in not feeling well that was um, it's very nice of you to do that. No, it was my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, thank you for all the hard work the, the group is doing on behalf of Vermont Libraries. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and our next. Our next person to provide testimony is going to be Kendra. Is Kendra here? I have not seen Kendra uh, in the meeting yet. OK. Um, I saw a note in the chat that one of our group members, Karen, was in touch with Joe, who unfortunately is not going to be able to join us after all today. So we'll, um, we'll need to rely on his written testimony, which we can do. Um, right now it is 11.26, so we may be seeing- three. I'm happy to go. <laughs> That's great. OK, wonderful. So you're, you're four minutes early, not. Not expected since we were running a little behind, but Bree, um, thank you for being here and thank you for jumping in with your testimony now and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Bree Drapa. I'm the director of the Westford Public Library. Um, I've been the director for almost 10 years now and um, I'm going to go ahead and read my testimony if that's OK. I know some of you guys might have read it, but um, I think my situation in library is a bit unique. Uh, we're a, we are a very small library, so um, maybe you can enjoy. Um, I love my library building. I love how old it is, how beautiful it is, how it creaks like an old ship when the wind blows, um, and how there's always that one squeaky board that you know. Um, I love its charm, its grace, its character, and there's so much to love, but there's also so much to do. My library building is really old. It was built in 1844, which my Midwest brain can't even wrap itself around. Um, my building predates the Civil War. Um, it was around to watch the troops muster and drill right across the street on the town green. It was built without electricity, without indoor plumbing, without the internet and other modern conveniences. It was built before automobiles, so much so that now our front door sits in the right of way of Vermont Route 128 and the historic windows rattle as the plow and large trucks go by. This wonderful old building has served the town in many capacities. It has always been a public building, never a church, never a school officially. It has hosted town meetings, traveling troops of performers, and even an indoor half-court basketball court in the 1950s. It served as overflow for the school next door, and some town residents remember toasting marshmallows on the coal stove in the basement between lessons. It served as the library since the late 1970s, and it's been in its current state since the early 2000s. 
The library is one of the nicest buildings in the town of Westford and people feel proud to have it in their town. If you own an old house, you know that there's always something to do, something breaking or an ongoing project. Running an old library is no different. On top of collection development, budgeting, programming, repair and maintenance take up a large portion of my time. I have learned so much about plumbing, wiring, fire codes, crawl spaces, insulation, preservation, and attics. In the past 15 years or so, we have installed a heat pump, replaced our old heating oil tank, upgraded our lighting for energy efficiency and brightness, completed insulating the building, installed a sump pump after the basement flooded, put in more outlets, upgraded our porch and handicap accessible ramp, redid our parking lot twice, painted the exterior and fixed every rotten clapboard. I'm sure there's more things I could add to this list, but you get the picture. So I'd like to point out three projects that have been very impactful for our library. First of all, our library uh, was, we had an insulation project. Before insulating, there was a foot of air between the outside wall and the interior wall. So just nothing, just a foot of air. Um, with help from Vermont Historic Preservation, we were able to insulate and cut our heating costs by 70%. We did this about 12 years ago, so if you just the heating cost that savings, we've been able to add to other building projects and um, stuff along the way. So huge savings, huge savings for the environment too. Um, we added a heat pump. Um, we have lovely historic windows that weigh about 100 pounds and do not open. Um, and it get, used to get so hot in this building that the computers would shut off and our lighting started to melt literally melt. Um, one time our thermostat flipped from 99 degrees inside to H. Um, and I said, well, you can interpret the H however you'd like. Um, it was not a pleasant working environment. So with the heat pump, we now have comfortable temperatures. Our lights and technology work a lot better. Our staff also works a lot better. Um, people stay in the building and cool off and programming is much more comfortable. We also installed a new ramp um, two years ago, which has which is secure. It's pleasing to the eye and it's accessible. A win for all of our patrons. This accessibility project um, has spurred us to look at other ways that to make our library more accessible. We have plans. It's part of our long range plan and it's a direction that our board continues to be very strong uh, to follow accessibility improvements. With all those improvements, you think we might be done, but no, there's another challenge to keep this old. There's always another challenge uh, with this old building. So looking ahead, I see three major challenges, um, and these are things that I think other libraries in Vermont also struggle with. Um, I've heard a lot of these same things on this call. The first is accessibility. We often say libraries are for everyone, but not everyone can get into all the places at my library. Our children's area is not accessible. It was built on an area that used to be a stage and you must climb four steps to get up there. There's no ramp, there's no lift. Um, and not only does this limit patrons with mobility issues, but it also limits access to families with strollers. I can't tell you how many babies I've had parked in front of my desk while they're sleeping in their stroller. Um, our bathroom and entryway have accessibility issues as well. Uh, while we have a kind of legal, I call it legal accessibility, you know, we have the two bars and maybe the doors swing the right way. The reality is quite different when you pile boots and coats and things in the way and all the stuff that we collect bins for the food shelf. Um, it's not really accessible and we're finding that accessibility changes are the ones we really need and they're very expensive. Another thing is space. Our buildings from 1844 and maybe people were smaller, but we could certainly use some more room um, here at the library. We're active. Um, we do a lot of programming. We have a huge summer reading program. We have adult programs. We just run out of space. Um, we are right up against Vermont Route 128 in the front and the back third of our library, I just found out, sits in a floodplain or a wetland zone. So it's not like we can expand back there. Um, adding another story on top of a, a historic building already gets complicated with architecture and preservation. We keep our floor plan flexible, but there's only so much you can do. 
uh, we have to keep our collection extremely weeded to be able to fit into our small space. Um, the last thing that's a challenge for us is water, um, both drinking and waste. Um, our building sits on the site of an old tannery from back in the 1700s, um, and our well is not drinkable. Um, it's contaminated with arsenic, which was used in tanning of leather back then. So it wouldn't kill you today, but it might kill me as I work here for years and years and years if I was drinking the water. We were also the only public toilet in town. Um, we just had a store open up, but their, their restroom is for patron, uh, their um, people who buy stuff only. So we're the only public toilet. We have an aging wastewater system that we share with the town office next door. Our leach field is under the town office parking lot. So that's a big problem. Our community is working hard to develop a community wastewater system, but it's expensive and it's challenging. If the system does not pass and the old system fails, we have very few wastewater solutions and they're very expensive. Thankfully, the state of Vermont has been generous to the town of Westford with grants um, to help out this community wastewater system, but there's still a lot of division in town about it um, as small town politics, some of you might know. Um, and of course, all of this work is done by a volunteer board of trustees and one full-time employee, me. Um, I do have a 10 hour a week assistant and I work 30 hours a week. So together we wake up one full-time person um, and the assistant doesn't do any of this kind of stuff. Um, we do not have a facilities manager for this building obviously, or for the town of Westford. Um, we lack the time money and expertise to handle all the building projects that should be done. Writing grants and fundraising take up so much time. Permitting and project management take up so much time. Researching and talking to experts um, take up so much time. And we're supposed to be running a vibrant library for our community. Um, I think Amy said it very eloquently as well um, and many people have said that there's we don't have the expertise we're not architects engineers building maintenance folks we're librarians it's not in our skill set um, as much as we'd like it to be um, one other building area i'd like to talk about um, that maybe is under a different purview but it's our digital infrastructure i see our um, digital infrastructure as an extension of our physical building uh, but our digital infrastructure is also suffering from the same problems as our physical infrastructure. It's not accessible to all of our patrons. It needs regular maintenance. It suffers from looking dated and out of touch. Um, I also have the same problems with being able to fix it. I lack time, money, and expertise. So I would like to see digital infrastructure included as part of the library's facilities. And lastly, how can the state help with all of this? I think money is self-explanatory and time might be an issue on our end, but I think the state could get creative with expertise. Um, our problem is not unique in Westford. Accessibility was the top issue in a recent Vermont Library facility study. Consultants with preservation, accessibility and construction expertise, architects who are vetted and understand the libraries, grouping the ordering of supplies, etc. Creative solutions would have a great impact on the library community especially our small and rural libraries. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here today and for providing a written oral testimony. Um, the topic of digital infrastructure, I think um, it may be a good idea for you to come back in May for a technology topic. Um, that's planning to, to include that. And I, I think that the scope of that is broad enough that 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 would be the potentially a good spot for this. Um, certainly, there is a physical component to technology as well. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just see it as an, it's kind of an extension. It's sometimes the only library our patrons visit if they use our digital library exclusively. Are there questions from members of the group? Great. Oh, I, hands went up. Instantly at the same time. Last time Andy lost the um, battle of the buzzers. So Andy's going to go first this time. Oh, I actually won last time, so I can defer. Oh, you did? Then then it has to be Susan. How about Susan? <laughs> Happy to hear from either. <laughs> yeah. 
I think either way is fine as well. I agree. Hi, Susan. Um, so were you here when Dana was giving testimony just before you? Yes. I, I wonder what your thoughts are on that idea of having someone who could do like a yearly library inspection. Oh, what I think, think it, I think it would be, I mean, you know, if it was the same person going around to all different libraries, maybe not a yearly library inspection would be needed, but you know, every couple of years, I, I would love to have some support in that issue. Um, mm -hmm. Someone who is knowledgeable, I think Kelly mentioned knowledgeable in the way libraries work. We work differently. Um, who is aware of kind of our charge to serve all um, and to have things accessible. I would love to. I mean, I have been up in the attic with the fire department, you know, crawling around. I have been down in the crawl space. I have been in these places with um, people and I would love to have a plan or a an expert to say like, hey, maybe you should look at that, you know, whatever, because right now it's piecemeal. It's the heating, <laughs> it's the HVAC guy that's like, yeah, you're going to need to replace that oil tank or oh, that over there needs to be fixed. Um, it's not a whole picture. And I think also too, I have learned so much in my 10 years here, but if I was to leave that institutional knowledge of the building gets lost. Um, and I think uh, it's hard, especially in a very small library to keep that written record of, you know, institutional improvements or who's the person do you call when this fails or this, you know, and not just when the lights go out or when the internet stops working, but you know, who's the person that handles the hot water heater and the this and that. So exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's wonderful. Nice to see you, Susan. <laughs> you too. Thank you, Susan. And then Andy. Hi, Bree. Um, Hi. I live in Essex and I visited your library and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful space. So thank um, you. Reminder or just a question, are you municipal, nonprofit, or hybrid? Okay. Municipal library. Mm -hmm. Cool. And my next question is, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. There is no delivery source of potable water to the library. Is that what you're saying? We have water that we can wash our hands, you know, mm -hmm. and, and yes, we have, um, yeah, you can't drink the water. Um, yeah, yeah, you I, couldn't cook that. with it. You couldn't, you know, I mean, you could, I guess, bathe with it, but. <laughs> um, so we do have a water cooler, like a bubbler yeah. um, that that people use for drinking water. It's a big hit with the kids, actually. Yeah, I can but. imagine. I could, yeah. Anyway, that, that I just wanted to be clear because that that that's pretty messed up. And I think one other. It's I not sure. unique. Our town office has the same issue and yeah. several of the homes around here. Um, have that same issue. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying. Okay. Are there any other questions from other members of the working group? Okay. Well, in that case, I, I think we are. Um, just making sure nobody else is raising their hand. Okay. Um, thank you. I just thank you for your time, and it's and it's nice to meet you. Yeah, it's very nice to meet you, Breeze. Thanks so much for coming here today and sharing your experiences and expertise with us, and um, we really appreciate it. We're going to take a pause um, from now until 2 p.m. Um, if Breeze still with us. If you think of anything later on that you'd like to share, please feel free to do so um, in writing. We did receive your testimony that will be posted, but if you think of anything additional, we can supplement and add that to your testimony. Um, and we appreciate your, your being here. So we're gonna take a pause now. It's 11.42. Um, we're going to reconvene at two. We will then hear from another seven folks hopefully um we did have two people this morning who were on the agenda who were unfortunately unable to to be here at the time they were scheduled um 
we tried to reach out to them to see could we get them in at another time, but it didn't work out. So that's why we're we're going to break a little bit earlier today. Um, so we'll be at recess until 2 p.m. And um, members of the board, if you could be at your at your devices and ready at two, that would be helpful so that we can maybe just a couple minutes before two so that we can get everybody here and just start on time with Lisa Samet, our um, first person to testify at two. Thank you all. <laughs>